Oh yes, the M4A1, it's pretty much perfect, you know what? But this is shorter with a longer barrel. It's also more ergonomic. The weight is more centralized. Why has the United States military not adopted a bullpup rifle? Is there a valid reason? Let's find out. Welcome back everybody, Clint here today with Classic Firearms, here to talk about bullpups, again, because obvious reasons, but really why the United States military didn't adopt a bullpup style firearm. Now if you look in recent history, this some of you might be like, well have they ever tried to? Have they ever fielded one before? And well, recently they did actually. The combination, or I should say the collaboration between True Velocity and General Dynamics with the RM277. Neat looking gun, uh, definitely has some very unique controls on it, and it's one that I wouldn't mind trying to shoot, I will say. But at the end of it all, it was fairly early on, kind of like scrapped, I guess you could say. And so, well, when you look at the traditional rifle, and I'm bringing my Mark 18 out because for one, it's been a while since you guys have seen it, uh, but also it's a great comparison uh, to bullpup style firearms due to its size. And we're gonna talk about the pros and cons of that here in just a moment. But as far as the United States goes, why didn't they select or why haven't they before selected a um, uh, bullpup style firearm? probably has a lot to do with kind of what we already know, probably has a lot to do with politics and economics. So let's just hop into it. First of all, let's talk about the ergonomics behind each firearm. Because one thing I can tell you is if you've been trained on an AR platform or an M4, M16, like the past several decades in the United States military, you'll know right away that um, this is actually a fairly ergonomic gun. This gun is very comfortable. It's very easy to get reloads done with, clear my functions and things like that, which is great. That's exactly what you need in a do-all type of firearm. In a bullpup design, and we're going to compare what I think is probably one of the most modular and capable uh, bullpups, and that is the IWI Tavor or the X95 Tavor. And this gun, for me, is a lot of fun to shoot. Uh, let's go ahead and talk about, like I said, the ergonomics. Notice right off the bat, hand placement. They're gonna be a little bit closer together than what you typically see on some of your ARs, but it also depends on how you hold the gun. If you're doing a magwell grip, it's gonna be kind of similar, but you'll notice you're kind of wrapping your hands up here kind of close. Not exactly the most comfortable thing for me. Getting a little bit further out there, and what's nice about the Tavor is it kind of has this like a little area here for it to ride. Yeah, it feels good. Ergonomics, you know, it's, it's a comfortable gun to hold. If you got a little bit more weight towards the rear of the gun, so it's closer to your center of gravity, instead of being a little bit further out, which means you're not gonna get as much fatigue on your support arm, which is great. Um, everything else about it, pretty similar controls to an AR. Look at the placement of the safety and also the ambi mag release right back there. Cool. But like I said, if you've been trained on this type of system, you're gonna notice really quick that trying to go ahead and do your manual of arms, uh, depending on what it is, a reload, chamber check even, things like that are gonna be a little bit different with a bullpup. We all know our simple reloads. Mag drops after the bolt locks to the rear, grab new mag, insert, bolt release on the left-hand side here. Sling's covering that up for you guys. But there you go, unless you have an ambidextrous AR, which are awesome. I've got an older Mark 18, so I don't have all the cool stuff that the uh, R3 does. Danny Defense, I'm talking to you guys. Anyway, all right, so what about on the Tavor? Now the controls on this bullpup are not gonna be the same like they are on the Steyrog or FS2000 or other, because right back here is actually your bolt release, bolt catch. Your mag release is in the same position on the Steyrog, so a little bit different. Bolt release is on the left-hand side of it. So it's not gonna be the same for every one of them, but this is actually the system or the setup that I prefer. As far as the rel reload goes here, your bolt will lock to the rear. Non-reciprocating, by the way. Thank you, IWI. Bolt locks to the rear. You can press the mag release again on either side. Mag drops free, which is nice. So grab a new mag, bolt release, shoot. Now, as far as placement of those controls go, again, the Tavor, why it's kind of like ideal when it comes to a bullpup for me, is because that naturally, especially if you train more and get that type of hand placement down for this, naturally, 
grabbing this, again, depending on how you have your mags oriented and your battle belt, and plate carrier, whatever, you come up here, insert the magazine with that thumb all simultaneously. You can send the round home and then start engaging again. It's quick, it's efficient, and it works really, really well. Okay, that's good. <laughs> but what if it's something as simple as trying to clear a malfunction? That's where things get a little bit more tricky with a lot of bullpup designs. The Tavor does a little bit better of a job uh, as to where you can at least see into the chamber. So in other words, I have a stoppage while shooting. Oh crap, I can kind of orient my face back here and then look and I can see into the chamber. I can see the opening of the chamber. You know, you simply drop the mag. Okay, cool, I can go ahead and get in here, do what I need to do to clear out whatever type of malfunction. So that's not as bad as it is on some other bull pups. But you'll notice on an AR, there's not really any type of repositioning of my face I have to do. I don't have to bring it back here. I can clearly see from right here into the chamber and be like, oh crap, we got something bad going on here. Let's drop the mag, get in there, do whatever I got to do, get it out. Go ahead and insert the mag, send the bolt home, and get back to work, right? Pretty similar on both of these guns. That's easy enough to do. Awesome. So ergonomics, I will say that the Bullpup is a pretty comfortable gun to shoot. Uh, or I should just say in this case the X95, which again, this is the Israeli rifle that beat out the M4 uh, for standard issue service in Israel. Now I've mentioned before in a previous video that they probably went with the Tavor because it's actually made in Israel. So that, that kind of makes sense too. All right. <laughs> the US isn't too keen on actually, you know, selecting firearms that aren't made in the US for standard issue. Um, granted, there's obviously been some deviance to that. But anyway, why though, still with overall, we're already seeing kind of a couple of benefits as far as the ergonomics and just comfortability of the firearm goes. But you'll notice when you start to try to manipulate the firearm in this type of manner in a prone position, which, well, the United States military is taught, if you can get as low to the ground as possible, or I don't know, behind some cover, and then engage the enemy, that's a really good idea because, you know, you want to make yourself as small as a target, and if you can find yourself some cover that actually stops incoming enemy fire, that's good. So try to do that. The moment you start to go into a prone position with... Wait, you should go prone on the table. Are you serious? Now, without actually being at the range to show you guys shooting in the prone position with a Tavor, which, yes, I have done, I'm going to try to show you guys really quick just about how, well, I'll give you my opinion about doing a reload, put it that way, in the prone position. And what better way to do it than just, you know, on the table here. <sighs> Phrasing. Anyway, all right. So aiming down the sight, shooting, shooting, shooting. Gun goes empty, right? So let's go ahead and lock the bolt to the rear. Gun goes empty. Now you'll already notice pretty much just like on an AR, I've got the mag kind of resting right back here. All right, easy enough. It's resting right back here so I can show you guys that. So the moment I try to drop it, there we go. Lift up a little bit, or I could rotate even if I need to. Grab my next mag. Insert, drop the bolt, and I'm back down. Okay, so you can see how much movement there was. What about that in comparison to a standard rifle? So let's try, go that way, my Mark 18 here. Same type of thing, I'm resting the mag on the ground just to show the type of consistency that we've got going on. All right, shooting, 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 gun goes empty. Out here, grab, insert, bolt home. For me, granted I've shot a lot more with this style of firearm. For me, I feel like it's just gonna be a little bit more natural for me to be able to go to get this reload done a little bit quicker because of, well, two things. Uh, one thing is the Tavor has done a really good job at trying to do, let me just. The Tavor has done a really good job at trying to mimic the type of controls that you get as far as bolt release and magazine placement. And that is just, again, insert magazine, thumb, go ahead and hit that bolt release. Same concept with the Tavor. Insert magazine, thumb, hit bolt release. Okay, easy enough. So having been more trained on this, granted, if I spent as many rounds and hours on this gun as I have with this one, I'd be very confident that I'd be very effective with this rifle. But I can say in a prone position, with things being a little bit more forward from my face, being able to see more of what's happening instead of having to kind of like, okay, where am I at here? This isn't as easy. 
Granted, it looks clean and good. It's because, well, I'm not under stress and I, I'm looking at it just fine. In this case, things are just more forward of my face. I can keep kind of things looking down that way. I'm not, I'm not deviating my eyesight away from the action, the muzzle end of the gun, as much as I am here. So instead of looking, you know, here, I'm looking here and still engaging and still manipulating the firearm. So I'm not having to deviate again my eyesight from the battle end of what's happening in the area around me. Is that that big of a deal? I don't know. Maybe, yes, maybe, no. You guys let me know. But there are some advantages, obviously, to the bullpup, which, again, I'm trying to be as unbiased as possible. Uh, but, for instance, a lot of the warfare that we're starting to see in, you know, modern war is... You're, you're shooting in more compact areas. You're clearing rooms, you're in vehicles, in and out of vehicles, you're pair dropping, you're whatever it might be. And having a more compact design is great. So a lot of you are probably like, okay, great. Grab your Mark 18 and hit it. What's the big deal? The big deal is that this is a 10.3 inch barrel. The 5.56 cartridge, which both of these are chambered in, it gets a lot of its effectiveness from velocity. You lose velocity when you lose barrel length. So the 16 inch barrel that's currently in the IWI Tavor is definitely more sought after or a better option for the 5.56 cartridge. A 20 inch barrel would be preferred, but then you start getting those real long guys that get kind of cumbersome to utilize inside of rooms and things like that. Granted, Marines were doing it in 2004 without any issues. Well, I won't say without any issues, but the Marines were doing it, still do it with a 20 inch M16A4. Like that, just like that actually. So, all right, you can do it, but it's not exactly the ideal tool for that job. Then all of a sudden you get something like this, okay. Now all of a sudden you have a 16 inch barrel over a 10.3 inch, and you've also got it in a, now well, even my, with this muzzle device, uh, my Mark 18 is slightly longer than the <laughs> Tavor is. So you're still getting a more compact firearm that's not losing out any type of velocity because you've had to cut down the barrel to get to that size. So in this case, yeah, the ballistics out of this gun should be better than, will be better than the ballistics out of this gun, even for how much I love it, right? And no, I know a few of you are gonna be already on the, down in the comments section. I do not prefer to be shot by either one of these, but if you were the one doing the shooting at an enemy combatant, you would probably want the one that has a more effective hit on target. Does that make sense? There you go. All right, cool. So now that you're inside of vehicles moving around and all that type of stuff, you want something that's gonna be a little bit more maneuverable, a little bit more manageable in those tight spaces. Again, that makes sense. You're keeping everything a little bit closer to the body, even all your controls closer to the body. I'm not reaching out here to change mags, I'm reaching back here. So everything again, more compact, tighter to the body, less movement is ultimately the goal with something like this gun. Just look at body mechanics and how all that works. Uh, granted, here in this country, we have been trained on this system. We know it very well inside and out, and we know the manual of arms very well. So trying to get used to something like this with a little bit of training and practice won't be hard. So financially, no, it doesn't really make sense to go ahead and switch out all those parts and everything else that we've had mass manufactured for so many freaking years to transition to something that probably isn't gonna get us that much larger of an advantage, if one at all, because there have been, let's just say, there's been a lot of arguments for each, right? And another one, when we talked about ergonomics before, is actually switching shoulders. Because becoming a left-handed shooter with a right-handed bullpup is sometimes problematic. Uh, the Tavor at least has a brass deflector, but one thing you'll notice is with a lot of different bullpups, like this guy, uh, you just see the rounds are coming back here and starting to chip up the stock. Not that big of a deal, it's just a cosmetic thing. It's not gonna affect the functionality or the performance of the gun. However, one thing that can do is hit a left-handed shooter right in the face, <laughs> or at least be kind of intimidating whenever you have that explosion taking place right by your face. And I think, even though I don't personally believe that there's too huge of a safety concern there, there still is a concern, yes, because if you've ever had a gun blow up on you before, it's intimidating. 
And so you don't want that to happen. You don't want an overpressurized round get caught up or some sort of manufactured defect take place from, from ammunition, magazine, doesn't matter what it is. The gun can be perfect, but if you have an assortment of other things that could go wrong or different variables that sometimes do go wrong, well, you want to try to go ahead and prevent any type of damage to the shooter, to, you know, that one individual that the United States military has spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on training. So, yeah, good idea to try to keep them safe and not have something bad happen to them. So if I'm shooting right-handed and, and some sort of incident occurs, hopefully that blowout takes place here, not on the seal on this side. You can, unlike the AR, switch which side it ejects. That's cool, but it's not gonna be something that can be done right in the middle of a combat zone. So if you are shooting right-handed and then you wanna to switch to left-handed, that's fine. Now you're here and now that brass is literally coming right across your face. Trying to communicate effectively, trying to inhale all those gases. Well, you're not trying to inhale all those gases, but you will be. <laughs> so look at it that way. In fact, there's been a lot of research done recently for the United States that are trying to go ahead and get silencers on guns with that flow through technology, thanks Huxworks, uh, to well prevent the guys that, from inhaling all this stuff and starting to have all sorts of health issues later in life. It's happening. When you think about how many rounds are being sent down range, trying to prevent those gases by one person, I mean, by, by trying to prevent those gases from coming back into the shooter's face, inhaling those toxic gases, well, yeah, trying to stop that's a good idea. So if you're here and then you have to come here, even then I'm starting to kind of like get a little fumbly on it here, coming around. Now you're shooting, now you're shooting, you're stressed out, you're engaging targets from your non-dominant side, you're inhaling, taking deep breaths, you've got this come in place, you have maybe a malfunction for an overpressurized round, this blowout could occur here. If you're left-handed and you switch to the extraction on the left-hand side, all right, cool, not that big of a deal, just like being right-handed with it on the right-hand side easy enough. So there's that. Probably another reason as to why it was kind of like, mm, not a good idea. Let's also talk about how much the United States military loves its modularity when it comes to this platform. The AR, the M4, and 16, and I don't mean to categorize all those together because they are different, right? This is more common with an AR because, well, it's not fully automatic for one, sadly but it does share a lot of qualities and characteristics that an M4 Mark 18, legitimately Mark 18, has. All right, as far as looks and all that type of stuff. Okay, cool. One thing I can do, if I wanted to, with, with ease, is put on a longer barrel and turn this now into a designated marksman rifle. Engage targets out to greater distance if I want to. If I want to do that CQB thing, here you go. If I want to do more of that urban combat thing where I don't know what I'll be engaging, I want that little in-between of a 16 inch or a 14.5, I can do that. That doesn't come as easily with something like this. Well, for one, if you wanted to swap out the barrel, even if you could and you could do it easily, that's great and all. Um, however, now your optics aren't going to be set up uh, for what you need. So you're going to you're gonna have to re-zero no matter what right there as I almost drop it. Uh, but with this, you go ahead and get your optics set up on each upper receiver, zero it for that upper, that caliber, whatever else. That's the other thing, caliber changes, you can do that. Bam, throw that on there, you're zeroed, you're ready to rock and roll. So there's that, right? Kind of like one lower receiver, multiple uppers to do a job of all. Cool, that's neat. So with all that being said, is sacrificing the I guess you could say the modularity, the trigger pull also on bullpups, they aren't as good. Let's just go ahead and put that out there. For instance, and I'm actually gonna show you a mil spec trigger because what I have in here is a Geisley trigger and that's just gonna be unfair. So take a look at this, we are clear. Trigger pull on a Tavor. You'll notice we have just a little bit of take up here and then it's squishy and then a little bit more there it is. Okay. It's not a bad trigger. It's just not great. Reset, 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 reset. There you go. Okay. Easy enough. It kind of feels like a Glock trigger. It's going to work. It's fine. It's not great, right? Okay. Now let's go ahead and grab a mil spec trigger off of the M16 here. And yeah, I just wanted to check it because every now and then I like to have fun and put some 
fancy triggers on these guys. So let's go ahead and show this off, right? We're clear. You'll notice a mil spec trigger is a single stage trigger, just like this one is. And so it's gonna be that same consistent pull all the way to the rear. You notice we have a little bit of travel. There it drops, okay. Easy enough, reset, comes on out. There it is. It's definitely a little bit shorter, and with this being a brand new gun, this one's been shot a little bit. Uh, it does feel a little bit gritty to me. It's a mil-spec trigger, it's not that great. Still, however, I think it would be one that I would prefer than what's in the Tavor out of the factory. All right, uh, even the Steyr AUG, the Army Universal Gewehr that we have right here, this one, it's just a, it's a mushy trigger also, but it does, it is nice and short. I will say that for your reset and pull. I actually think I like the AUG trigger better than the Tavor trigger, but to each their own. All right. So is that a big deal? I would say for the United States military, yeah, they want cleaner, crisper triggers. Uh, they want to make sure that the shots that are going down range are going to be a little bit more accurate. And so you typically get that with a little bit cleaner trigger as well. If you're sitting there just kind of screwing with the trigger a little bit, like, okay, when's the thing going off? Um, it sometimes just isn't all that great. All right. So there's, like I said, pros and cons to both systems. I really, really do like that you get a compact overall length with the bullpup while maintaining a longer barrel so you don't lose that velocity out of whatever cartridge that you're shooting. I do like the manual of arms for the most part if it's a dedicated right-handed shooter. If I wanna go from right to left with my Mark 18 here, easy enough to do so and the, a, the action is still forward and away from me so that way I can still see everything that's taking place. If I have a malfunction, I can still turn this here. All right, cool, I'm good. Which again, I can do, but it's definitely, <laughs> obviously I'm used to a rifle here because you see every time I need to po pay attention. I need to focus where my placement is. Here, again, I'm having to kind of take my eyes off the combat in front of me, off the action in front of me to see exactly what's happening. Again, maybe not the biggest deal, but it is a thing, right? Also, as you start to learn the gun more, it's gonna become a little bit more effective for you to keep everything happening, keep your eyes down range. Again, the Tavor isn't one that I have a lot of experience on. I'm still having to deviate my eyesight a little bit and maintain exactly what's going on and see what's going on over here. At least as far as the bolt release goes, I like that, love that placement. And it's nice, wide, you've got a lot of surface area so you don't have to be completely precise with it, which honestly is kind of a setback depending on what type of bolt release you have on your M4, M16. It's facing the wrong way. So you've got, th got this little guy right here that's gonna be a little bit smaller surface area to try to maintain contact with to send the bolt home under that stressful situation. With the Tavor, it is larger here and very easy and it just comes naturally. Granted, training, practice with both are gonna get you to where you need to go. That's what matters, all right? And you'll notice, even though I have spent some time with this gun, just handling it, going back from the gun that I know, like the back of my hand, Boom, okay, cool, this feels good to hold all over the place. I'm still picking this thing up and grabbing it by the magazine, things like that. So trying to go ahead and train our current inventory of soldiers or riflemen or Marines or whoever's operating one of these to one of these, there's gonna be a learning curve. And is it one that we're willing to risk for however long it takes to get some guys with a thick skull like me to start running these effectively and as naturally as this has come over several decades of military use. I don't know. I don't, I don't think so. Again, we look at the more modern general dynamics, true velocity collaboration of the RM277, which was pretty quickly kind of like, no, nah, we're not going to even consider that, even though it seemed to be a good performer. The NGSW, you know, program pretty much went to SIG. And so, you know, there, there we have that. Granted, there's also been some back and forth about what's really happening there. Still got to do some research. Maybe we'll come out with a uh, part two as the NGSW program continues to go in whichever path it's going to go down. Uh, but anyway, with that being said, let me know what you guys think. Do you think the United States military simply hasn't adopted something as cool as a bullpup? Because, well, there's not any really a lot of American manufacturers making a 
reliable quality one. Not to say that there isn't, I'm just saying one that already has DOD contracts or anything like that. I don't know, do you think it's the manual of arms? Do you think it's the reliability? Do you think it's just being able to clear out malfunctions? What, what is it that you guys think? Why hasn't the military, the United States specifically, adopted one of these? Do you think they just looked at the L85 and said, oh hell no, we don't even want to get close to something like that? <laughs> That's such a terrible gun. Um, uh, or do you just think, hey, this works. We've already got a lot of, lot of backing for this system. We've already got a lot of manufacturers making parts and components and a lot of good deals for cheap parts that run. Let's just not screw with it right now. Let me know what you guys think. And with that, make sure you head on over to cfcontest.com to check out what we got going on over there. And as always, we appreciate you and your business. God bless, and I'll see you down in the comment section below all about bullpups versus M4s in this case and why the United States military should or should not adopt a bullpup.